It's my honor and privilege to be here to speak to you at the Association for Theater for Higher Education. I can't think of a more important front line for the young theater professionals in this country than associations like yours that understand the importance of theater education and how it relates not only to the growth of the artist, but to the growth of the citizen. I've found in my 35 years of doing theater that there is no more effective way to truly stir the hearts and minds of people than a live event. Hundreds, if not thousands of people sit in a dark room and share an experience with a group of actors. I have been profoundly moved myself and I have seen with the work that the Actors Gang has been doing throughout the years that this is a truly potent event. People often ask, why do theater? Um, why not continue in uh, what must be a much more fulfilling uh, uh, career in film? In fact, in Los Angeles, when you do theater, it's uh, kind of subtext for there must be something wrong with your career. Uh, I, I've never felt that. I've always felt that the theater gave me so much. Uh, that has informed my work as a writer and a director and as an actor in film. I also feel that there is nothing quite uh, as visceral and real as the experience of live performance. Issues of the death penalty, issues of uh, illegal uh, behavior in government, issues of uh, unjust war. There's a tendency, I think, uh, when approaching serious subject matter or relevant social subject matter, for the artists to um, take themselves maybe a little too seriously. I think we have to understand that regardless of what the actual material is that we're working on, that theater is a shared experience. And when I say shared, I mean the audience is as important as your own intellect or what you feel you want to quote unquote say with a play. That's why I have always approached in all my work a emotion first process without getting at the emotional truth of a character. A piece can tend to drift into propaganda. I've been participating with Sister Helen Prejean uh, with, with the Dead Man Walking Theater Project. To understand the weakness of the murderer on death row, to have compassion for the antagonists you write as well as the protagonists, to really give the point of view that you may not agree with weight, serious weight in the argument of the play to respect the victims' families and the experience that they go through that we found in Dead Man Walking was really the key to the door that allowed people that were for the death penalty to sit in the theater or to sit in the movie theater and watch this play and be moved emotionally so that they could have a discussion about it afterwards. Ultimately, for me, the best theater audience is one that is involved emotionally with the, with the piece itself and comes out of the theater with questions in their mind. But we've also gotten into incredibly interesting and beautiful experiences, not only with the plays we've done, but with the talkbacks we do after plays. Taking embedded uh, uh, anti-war satire about Iraq in 2004 and 2005 into the heartland, into the blue and red states, and by the way, they're purple, uh, because the experience on the ground in America is an entirely different experience from what you might categorize uh, in the media. Uh, the divisiveness that is constantly being promoted by the idea of the difference between Republicans and Democrats. What we have found in America 
is an incredibly mature and informed citizenry that wants, that wants to discuss, that understands the severity of war and the need for discussion before one en enters into it, that understands that even though you may disagree with someone, that you can still respect them and their views as American. That's what we found, taking embedded live, uh, taking embedded, taking uh, uh, dead man walking, taking uh, exonerated, uh, and taking uh, 1984 out into Republican quote unquote areas. What we find is there's an incredible uh, generosity of spirit. Escape is great, but we are dealing with and living in a complicated time, a time that demands social action from its artists, a time where it's necessary for people with influence in the arts to rise up and to use their positions of influence and power to say enough is enough. We're going to deal with something here. We're going to take a stand. We're going to have the courage of our conviction. We are going to assert our freedom in a free society. In 2003, well first 2002 and 2000 into the early 2003, <coughs> I came out pr uh, pretty strongly against uh, the war in Iraq. Um, I came out, well, I came out first saying we should give the uh, inspectors more time. Essentially, that was probably the most radical thing I said. But at the time, as you remember, there was an incredible drive towards war. I think a media analyst group uh, did an analysis of all networks on cable and uh, major networks and uh, found that over the course of a two-month period before the war, 500 some odd people were on, military experts, quote unquote, that were advocating for the war. And in that same time period, about four or five activists that were opposed to the war. At the time, as you remember, the country was split 50-50 on whether we should go to war. So there you have an example of uh, a media not reflecting what was happening in the world and in the society. 50-50 split in the American public, what you're dealing with there is a pretty intense propaganda, a selling of the war. Some of us stood up. Um, some of us tried to stop the train. Um, I remember at the time a lot of people not standing up, including most of our elected representatives. Someone asked me at the time, why are, why are, why are you, you're an actor, why are, you, why are you speaking out against the war? And I said, well, you, listen, I'd much rather not, but uh, I don't see any opposition party in this country that is. And so the real question is, why is it up to actors or artists to be the ones to try to stand in front of the moving train? I was at a state fair in a rural area of Florida. I was at uh, the Final Four at San, San Antonio, Texas. I was at football games, hockey games, places where you might imagine that those crazy right-wing people might be, and they weren't there, folks. I was safe. My radical opinion was safe. Despite being marginalized by the press, despite being attacked with words, incendiary words, that tried to make me into something I wasn't, I was safe because the average American out there is for freedom of speech, is for freedom of expression, is for creative expression. They're mature enough to understand that even if they disagree with me, that I have a right to say that. You wouldn't have gotten that impression watching the media or reading the newspapers in 2002 and 2003. But my unique perspective is that it was safe. And in fact, those people that were advocating for this war never really did have a true majority in this, in this, uh, in this venture. Now, why, how does this relate to theater? Well, it relates in that I can tell you that 
there is a desire and a need for freedom of expression out in this country. There are also people with very, very loud voices, megaphones, and access to media that try to intimidate free expression. They have always been there from the beginning of this republic, and they will always be there. But you have to understand that they are a minority. They may have positions of power, and they may think, make things difficult in certain communities in this country. But know that there is a public out there that is desperately in search of creative expression, of people that challenge, of people that question, of people that want to debate, of people that want to be actively involved, that know that that is what is at the essence of a democracy. What I mentioned earlier about trying not to take things too seriously, and I want to be clear on what, what I'm talking about as far as that goes. Sometimes when you're dealing with material that has a, a severity to it or uh, um, is, is dealing with emotionally uh, things that are very dark and, and uh, as an actor or artist or dancer or musician, you have to go pretty deep to get the truth of what that is. We mustn't ever forget the joy of life and the ability to take moments to enjoy each other, uh, to sit, to drink, to laugh, to dance, to make love. That's part of being an artist too. That's an important part of being an artist. Because we have to be able to find, even in the darkest material, even in material that deals with some of the most serious subject matter, that sense of humor, that indelible human spirit that is capable of irony and satire and humor in the midst of some of the darkest situations. We mustn't ever forget that because without that, without that, this becomes a joyless profession. And we mustn't ever let that happen. Because at the end of the day, that spirit is what holds us all together. And that spirit is what inspires others to action, to question. That spirit that, yeah, I may be down. I may be surrounded. I may be in a hopeless situation. But I can find the light in it. And I'm going to get out of it. And I'm going to survive it. And I say this to you, being in New Orleans, that that is key. To hear music coming out of that city after what it went through is doubly inspiring. It's not just good music. It's the music of the ages that survives the deepest tragedy. The sound of a lone clarinet coming out of a desperate situation is something that no man can write, that no politician can draw attention to. It's that indelible human spirit that is best possessed by the artist that understands we're living in a serious world. But part of our job is to find the light in the midst of all this mess. Thanks for having me here today. I appreciate the invitation. I wish I could be there with you. Uh, I'm there with you in spirit. Um, have a drink for me. And I'd like now to introduce uh, a very good friend of mine, a person that has inspired me deeply and uh, whose work is absolutely essential uh, to add to the great spirit of humanity in this country and throughout the world. Helen Prejean.